What's up, YouTube? My name is Matt. Sometimes I go by the Grass Factor. Martin! It is Wet and Wild Wednesday. How's everybody doing? Uh, alongside me, I have Ray Eno for the time being. DeMay is efforting. He will be here as soon as possible. Of course, it's bedtime, so you know, we got to get the kids put to, put to bed and all that fun stuff. So, mm -hmm. these are a yep. little younger than mine, and you know, I used to have to do that, but now, and they come to me and like, Dad, I gotta go to bed. I'm like, Great, see you tomorrow. So it make, <laughs> make, makes it easy. So, I'm uh, I'm <laughs> I'm lucky. It's one of those things, you know, that when you're having kids young, it kind of crosses your mind. I'm like, man, am I old enough to do this? Am I mature enough to do this? And the answer is no, right? Definitely not. But on the flip side is that now at 37, uh, Asami and I have gained a little independence back, right? And that that makes it fun again because it's like, yeah, you know, hey, motherfucker, go brush your teeth. I'm not supposed to cuss <laughs> this quick into the show. But anyway, I digress. Uh Okay, uh, this is going to be another Q and A show. What's going to be fun tonight is that we have we have some uh, topics left over from last week, and we have we have a good one that we are going to be going over tonight. And I'm excited to go over this because we have another live fire example where someone conducted a my soul test and then took another soul test across multiple years and compared it against. Um, uh, what they had recommended by uh, Texas A&M, right? So they did their extension, and then they did uh, a MySoul test, and the results are 100% shocking, to say the least. Uh, this is not the first time we've done this, but I definitely want to dedicate a uh, a good chunk of, uh, of time to this topic today, just because uh, it continues to come up and... Um, uh, you know, I know Dr. Shaddix gave a little bit of the scientific method behind uh, what goes into each of these test methodologies, whether you're using, you know, acid extractants. He did it. He did an even more in-depth one uh, with Dr. Michael Woods that was incredibly interesting. And uh, we were talking about using, uh, um, oh, God, what was it? Uh, there was a compound that was in lieu in lieu of ammonium acetate. They were they were they were using another one. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it was a fascinating topic uh, nonetheless. And uh, so anyway, I, we thought, well, okay, great. Here we have another example of where we can compare a mysol test against uh, a, a, a more traditional acid extractant, where we have uh, more calibration data, more correlation data as to actually how how it results in in turf quality, right? Which is ultimately what we're interested in. Because, and why we bring this up is that if you were to take your same soil test, send it to Penn State, you're going to get a certain set of recommendations. You send it to Ward Laboratories, you're going to get another set of recommendations. You send it to uh, uh, Midwest Labs, you get another set. You send it to Waters, you get another set. And it's not that any of those labs are, are, are uh, bullshit labs. They're all very legitimate labs. But we want to emphasize the point that whatever recommendations you get on a soil test, you need to crumple it up and throw it away. Just just like ignore that piece of it. You can take your actual values. That's fine. Your values are good. That is good. Uh, uh, for, for the most part, that's that's it's going to be the best data you have to work with. Right. Assuming your your methodology is the best met methodology you have to, to work with. I think, you know, again, everyone check out Dr. Shaddix's channel, Turf Epistemology, uh, where he goes over more of the, the nuance involved of why certain soil test methodologies and even acid extractants have fail points. That's not what we're going to get in today. Uh, but uh, if you want to learn about that, go check it out. Go become a member over there. It's I, I can't even remember what it was. It's it's like it's like seven, eight, nine, ten bucks to become a member over there. And and you get unfettered access to one of the most uh, 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 brightest minds in the turf grass industry that actually gives you actionable data. I'm a big fan of, of actionable data, right? People can rattle off statistics to you all you want, but when you actually have actionable data, that is a game changer, right? And I, and I think between, you know, Dr. Kreuzer, and I'm going to leave out a shit ton of people here and I feel guilty about it, but between Dr. Kreuzer, um, uh, Dr. Shaddix, uh, Dr. Woods, um, uh, you know, all, all all of these are very actionable approaches, and that's that's why we're such fans of what they do. Is that because it actually uh, uh, filters its way it, our way down into whether you're an LCO, whether you're a homeowner, uh, whether you do sports turf, it does it doesn't matter. It's all it's all data that can pertain to you, and especially influence a lot of your buying decisions while you're out in the field, right? So anyway, check him out uh, because he gets into more of the nuance of the different methodologies and extractants. However, 
what we are going to be looking at again is just comparing of what the actual results are and why we see what we see in the results and how that can actually impact your decision making on what you apply. And on the, the, the flip side of that is it's not only what you're applying, it's the fact that what you apply uh, based on the data that's presented to you may end up creating another scenario where you're left with a turf quality that is so lackluster that you're like, why do I even do this? Okay. <laughs> that's what we're trying to steer you away from is not getting bought into a wormhole that leads you into another wormhole that there is no escape, except if you quit. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> Th that's no good. That is no, that's wasted time. That's wasted money. That's wasted effort. And that is, uh, uh, ultimately what gives this industry a bad name. And so we need to highlight it so you don't make that mistake. So we're not contributing to the problem. The problem being uh, applying nutrients that aren't going to be utilized by the plant that can find its way into waterways and all the other you know different downstream effects that can occur that are bad, net negatives, right? We want to make sure that when we make an application, whether it be pesticide or fertility related, that it is a net positive. We are we are generating a positive result. No no negative result here, please. Um, if you do have questions, we're going to take questions here for about, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to call it just so that way we, we block off enough time to, to talk about this. Uh, we are going to switch to this topic probably at about 930. This question came in from Oscar. And, uh, and so anyway, we, we will, we will jump to it at about 930. I'm, I'm saying this out loud to also register with J pink too, and everyone else on the panel, because uh, I will forget. Um, there's enough bullshit coming into my head right now <laughs> that if I don't say it out loud, then I'll, I'll just, I'll forget. Let's just be honest. Um, so anyway, Oscar, we are going to get to your question from last week. Uh, it's a great question, by the way, and thank you for the data that you submitted to us. And that's why we're so excited. And of course, I think we're, this is, this has got to be one we clip out into its own video and just, and just throw mm -hmm. it out there. And I, and I think it coincides exactly with a lot of what's already been discussed from a scientific perspective, but now we see it actually in a, in a, uh, in applied science or practical perspective too. So that's, that's what makes it so exciting. Uh, that being said, if you do want to submit questions, submit them in the chat, or you can email us at mail at the Please understand that we are doing this live. And as we do this live, we make mistakes, uh, fact check everything we say, fact check it twice. Um, again, it's off the cuff. We're human. We're fallible. We make mistakes. Uh, sometimes we're thinking about one thing and we answer it another way. Uh, so again, just double, triple check, especially if we're giving rates or making recommendations on a pesticide. Always, always, always double check us. Uh, also, if you uh, do not want to sit in front of YouTube and watch this, you don't have to. Uh, luckily, we have this in podcast format, too. So all your favorite podcast apps, whether it be Spotify, YouTube Music, or you know, what, whatever you do, Google, I don't, I don't even know. What, what do the kids listen? Everybody uses Spotify nowadays, right? Oh, Apple, Apple Podcasts. There's a certain segment of nerds that use that, I believe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but out, outside of everything else is garbage, isn't it? I Heart Radio, maybe I don't know. I Heart Radio, God, what are you doing? I just, what? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm. I'm not on drugs. I think that's the problem, actually. That's but, like going to Blockbuster to rent drugs. porn. Go to the fucking adult <laughs> bookstore like a real man. Hey, find the next truck stop. You know, go down, go down I forty, two or three exits, and get you some real stuff. Don't. Oh, dear. The, the exit radio. before the split, before before the forty seventy five <laughs> split. That's 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 the one you get want to go to. There's three giant crosses on the side. That's how you know you've reached the right one. It's strange things <laughs> you see in Tennessee. Spend 18 years trying to get in there, and then you walk past the jizz mop on your way in, and you turn out, and you nope right out of there. Remember that, kids. <laughs> nope. Uh, nope. Okay, so we are uh, – we'll, we'll kick this off with a couple ones we had from last week. Uh, Michael a. Ewald – Michael Ewald – Ewald. Uh, the message is using a fertigator easy flow, an efficient way of applying nitrogen to a lawn with a hose end nozzle. A fertigator oh. easy flow. Let me look this up. Uh, I know what that is, easy Matt. Flow. Okay. I know what that is. Okay. I'll tell you guys what this is. This is a device that operates via pushing a small amount of water into a tank. Mm -hmm. And then it uses that water pressure to push whatever's in that tank back out into your line. However, yeah. There is 
a dilution factor. In other words, you know, as this thing is running, whatever's in your tank gets more and more dilute. So I got to tell you guys, I do have a pump called a mix right mounted on top of a hand truck and there's a five gallon bucket below it and i do use that for high volume fertilizer and you know soil amendment drenches but that mix right is a proportional pump that i can set at a fixed ratio so say i set that pump to a hundred to one so i know when i have that running i'm drawing one part of concentrate to 100 parts of water or else one gallon of concentrate to 100 gallons of water and it never changes. That dilution rate stays consistent throughout the run. Whereas mm. with the easy flow, in time, whatever's in your tank gets more and more dilute until you end up with nothing. Yeah, uh, right. there it is. L let me tell you right now, when you have a fertigation system that uh, that cost eighty nine dollars, I'm just I'm just gonna put a word of warning out there. <laughs> the engineering is probably not that exceptional. Even the Chinese are like, eh, I don't know. <sighs> ah. Okay, Timo reviews and are four point two. <laughs> That's it. Could go either way. You could go either way. Let's put it this way. Uh, nowadays, you know what I've seen uh, on Alibaba? I've seen <laughs> Dos Dosatron copies. Children. No, I've seen Dosatron <laughs> copies on Alibaba. Yard bra, what? So, oh, oh, no, 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 no. Not going there, not doing that. <laughs> uh, not the yard bra. <laughs> no. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, that's after not, show topics. No, yeah, that's uh, that's for USA Today to get involved with. Oh, oh. anyway, anyway, <laughs> anyway. What's our name? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the eighty nine dollar system. No, do not do that, uh, Michael Ewald. Uh, yeah, and again, that's designed for an irrigation system with stationary heads, not for you to be moving across the lawn. Uh. Because again, it is going to go through dilution as you continue to use that. Uh, Michael Caparino said, "Can you discuss biosolids on one of your shows? Apparently, human su sewage is contaminated with PFAS, with PFAS, and they are still present in biosolids in product even after processing and filtering." Yeah, and it's not just PFAS. So PFAS are mm -hmm. perfluoro -alk uh, alkylated substances, and mm -hmm. uh, and you know, here's the reality of the situation: is that we know it's bad. We don't know how bad it is. Like, we know it's bad, right? But as far as, like, is it chronic bad or is it acute bad? Then we also don't know the scale at which it is spread right now. Uh, and up until recently, we haven't really known what to do about it. Uh, I will say that there are remediation companies out there. I saw a patent recently where they were treating it with calcium EDTA and then pyrolyzing it at very high temperatures. Uh, in order to break those fluoride bonds. Uh, there's other com companies that are focusing on like uh, in situ capturing and removing. Uh, that'll be uh, companies like uh, Regenesis. That's probably one of the only scalable solutions that I've seen on the market right now. So there, there is finally some solutions in play, right? Scalable solutions that are in play. In regards to biosolids, here is the fact that no one wants to talk about is that mm -hmm. from a fertilizer blending perspective, okay, 99% of the fertilizer that you're going to use in TNO, especially lawn care, right, is going to be a blended fertilizer. There's, there's no budget in, in lawn care for homogenized fertilizer. Homogenous fertilizer is expensive, right? Because you, in every granule, you have the exact same ratio of nutrients in it. So that's more going to be in like specialty crop. You'll find it in golf. Uh, you'll find it in trees and shrubs. Uh, some lawn care people do use homogenous fertilizer. It used to be a bit more available than it is now, back when Super Rainbow was on the market. But yeah, it's Super Rainbow now is so hard to find that, you know, it's if you don't live in an area with specialty ag, then you're probably not going to be able to find it. So it's, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it's so cheap as a blender base, right, as a filler material. Traditionally, we use 
limestone. You use ground up limestone at, you know, 180 S gen. Basically, you run it through a six mesh screen from a six to a, uh, you know, what was that, like 24 mesh screen. You filter out, you screen out all the fines and you screen out all the oversized material and you put it in bags. And then when you're doing your blend and you've got, you know, 36% urea in your blend, 22% potash in your blend and 18% map in your blend. And then you balance it off. You got to, you got to fill the rest of it to equal hundred percent on the back end. What do you use? Well, you, you use limestone, right? Well, then came along biosolids. And biosolids was an organic source of N and P that was derived from human shit. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily from human shit, but it's the bugs that digest human shit. And then you, you kill, dehydrate, and then granulate the bugs, right? So... Um, now you've got this organic filler material that increases the value of the blend, but the cost of the biosolids is really low. In fact, it's on par with the cost of lime. So not only are you adding uh, the, the, the filler material to fill up the remainder of the bag, you're also adding value to the bag. So what you used to be able to sell for 15, now you can sell for 21, right? But your cost in producing it and acquiring the raw materials to produce it didn't change. So the, the margins on it are great. Okay. And there are, when I, when I say they're great, you got to think about it this way. There is no margin in blending fertilizer. So if you can capture any margin in blended fertilizer, that is like one of those things. Thank God we're going to live to see another year. Because if you only do blended fertilizer, your scale has to be so big to make 5%, maybe 10% margins on a great year with you catch the commodity fluctuation just right. You'll make 10% rest of the time. You're probably gonna make five. And that is, that is not the kind of business you want to run. Imagine running your lawn care business, making 5% margins at the end of the year. Not very fun for the level of work you do to it. So, so I get it. I'm not faulting blenders for this, right? You, you know, you got it. You got to be profitable to operate a business. And that is a way that helps them be more profitable or at least give them leverage in negotiating power when, when dealing with larger, you know, bulk buying customers. Okay. That being said, well, cats out of the bag turns out all the PFAS that's in the shit we eat and our cooking utensils and plastics that we use Turns out that's passing right through our bodies into our waste stream, uh, namely our piss and shit. And, uh, and then as that gets consumed by the microbes and the bugs and they, and they get dried and turned into biosolids, it's carrying out to that. You know, the next piece of it too is going to be the microplastics that we're not even talking about yet. But I think if you start analyzing that, if it's showing up in, in your heart, uh, uh, deposits in your, um, uh, in your cholesterol, you've got, you've got microplastic deposits. Chances are it's probably in our biosolids too. So now cats out of the bags is happening. We saw with the big compost facility that we covered on, uh, on burn and return up in the, I think it was in mass. They were, they were bringing like in where, biosolids. Uh, yeah. They're was it mass? Uh, was it Maine. Uh, I, I, think I think it was New York. England. I think it was, I think it was mass. New York. It was New York. It was actually New York, Matt. And there's yeah. one more right along the river, set. Hudson yeah, River. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was right, Hudson River. Right along the Hudson mm -hmm. River, and there's yet one more set of things that people are not necessarily thinking about, but it is significant biologically. And that is, okay, let me name some names. Uh ciprofloxacin, uh, fluoxetine. Do those so we've got bill, antibiotics. We have SSRIs. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I highlight those is because chemically, those pharmaceuticals are structured very similarly to PFOS, Matt. Structurally, they're very similar. And so, therefore... Fluorinated, fluorinated drugs. Mm -hmm. Fluorinated hydrocarbons. And so, what my point is, is... We are talking about chemicals that are very persistent in the environment. And I think I said previously that a lot of these pharmaceuticals 
will literally become our next DDT. We're going to find these pharmaceuticals in places where we never expect them. And the reason why we're going to find them in places where we never expect them is because they do not degrade. Because, by the way, say somebody gets a fluoxetine prescription, right? And that fluoxetine passes through their body and ends up at the wastewater treatment plant. Okay? And that is what happens. Or say somebody gets a round of Cipro because they have some kind of gnarly infection. Same thing. That passes through them and ends up at the wastewater treatment plant. Right? And well, so... Well <laughs> Let me give you a number just to put into perspective. Okay. There are, as of 2020, there are 6 million, and, and this is this is up from 4, 4 million in 2016. In 2020, so I, I would assume we're probably closer to 10 million. Uh, uh, t we'll, say, we'll say eight to play it safe. 8 million people are prescribed fluoxetine in the United States. <sighs> So we'll say 8 million doses are being urinated or excreted every, day. every, day. every day. Yeah. Yeah. And then across a year and then across mm -hmm. five years and then across 10 years at a growing rate because it, 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 less people are not using, <laughs> are not using it. It's, it's, it's actually growing. <laughs> <laughs> it is the 20, and, uh, 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 I'm sorry. It, um, the number of prescriptions in the United States as of 2021 is 22 million. Okay. Mm. Um, 22 geez. million prescriptions just for fluoxetine, right? Yes. This is for fluoxetine summary for 2021. Yeah. It is the 25th most prescribed drug in the United States. Good Lord. Good Lord. And uh, the deal with that one is, you know, when people are on that, it is not a short-term prescription because you can literally no. be on that for years. Yeah. You can be on that stuff for years, right? I mean, it's like you, once you start it, you are just on it. Which, you don't get taken off of it in a month. Uh -oh. Probably means that the number's higher than 8 million. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's, that, I mean, that's, that's, okay. So point being is that PFAS is, is a way uh out there widespread very very macro problem that we're dealing with and i think it's so big right now and the scale of it is so ununderstood that's why we're not hearing so much about it i think it's one of those things that if you just went full-fledged in an effort to try to notify the public all at one time the reality of this situation between you know your perfluorinated alkyl substances and even if you took even similar structures or uh things that readily bind to fluorides you know certain types of surfactants readily blind, bind to, to fluoride which creates a perfluoroalkyl substance there's mm -hmm. there's a lot here that we're dealing with that is frightening and i think it would create such mass panic with no scalable solution that uh you know it would it would honestly if if you were to test, we'll say we'll say you took a hundred Americans across every metropolitan area in the United States, and you measure PFAS in their system. I think the number and the concentration would scare the shit out of everybody. I think I think uh, honestly, it would make the C virus look like child's play. Well, the other thing too is, and we, we've read this in the uh, literature about PFOS, right? That I think as of 2021 or 22, there was like 130 compounds uh, that they were testing for. Now that's up to like 150 to 180. And the number of PFOS compounds, synthetic PFOS compounds in nature right now is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 15,000. So when yeah. we say testing, like we're only testing for what we know about in a way so one you know one one hundredth of a percent is what we're actually scratching the surface on so i think there's validity to that statement that 
whether it's the prescription drugs, um, you know, the chicken or the egg argument there, but to see these go away is going to be, I, I don't think it's going to be as painful as, you know, just saying, Hey, you can't have any fertilizer. Like we're in the Netherlands or something like that, but it'll be interesting to see. So bottom, bottom line is this is, uh, if you have that in your program, if you're, you know, a commercial applicator, you should probably find life elsewhere because it's going to go away at some point and all the purported benefits are dwarfed, dwarfed uh, by what we are far- starting to learn about this stuff. And there's better options out there. So time yeah, what's, what, what's, what, what's Ray safe? Don't put shit on your lawn. Yeah, because I got I got another one for you. In, if we want to talk about pharmaceuticals that are environmentally persistent progestins and orally available estrogens and you know why i bring this up it's because the common meme is oh a certain you know certain pesticides are making the frogs and the fish the other way and Okay, my counter to that is if that were true, then if I wanted to be a she, all I'd have to do is go drink a teaspoon of herbicide and that would take care of that problem. But I suspect that a lot of the issues with our aquatic life having, you know, abnormalities, I suspect that that is partially due to the amount of progestins and estrogens that these fish and wildlife are exposed to in the water because, uh, oh, that's the other thing, Matt and Ryan. How many people are on birth control? I'm a huge advocate for male birth control. And I and I want to make that, and I am not fucking around about that either. Uh, it is it is out there. It's it's illegal, which is even more so, insane. And so it's uh, highly illegal, Matt. And the reason why it's, it's highly illegal, insane, is because it is because here's the rationale. Because by the way, Matt, you know when I, you know when I first heard about male birth control, I first heard about it in the 1990s. Matt. I oh, that's started, crazy. You know, you know, no, I, I heard about, about it, it two years 90- ago. No, I heard about it in the 1990s. And you know what the experiment was, Matt? They took a group of men, right? Healthy, you know, men, you know, married men. And they gave all of those guys injectable testosterone every week. And you know what happened to their fertility? It went, it went to zero, and they got swole. <laughs> no, they didn't get swole. They didn't get necessarily get swole, but then that's, that's their, their sperm counts went down. But the only issue that the FDA didn't like about it is, okay, maybe there were slight elevations in blood pressure, slight changes in cholesterol. And, oh, these guys lost fat. These guys lost fat. And between the cholesterol and the blood pressure changes, the FDA deemed this is an unacceptable side effect. Hello, Matt. I mean, how many drugs do we have out on the market with crazier and wilder side effects? In other words, there's a black box warning that says, you take this pill, this shit will kill you. Because uh, Matt. <laughs> so here's, here's the thing is that we got to Or you'll self-delete, about... which is what's even scarier, which I think is on the black, spot, black box warning of fluoxetine, is that uh, be careful because uh, when you get started on this, uh, there's a... There's a, a high degree of probability you may you may self delete. I'm like man, c- no, wow, I don't know about all that. No. Not good. I don't. Okay, but then my point is is that 
what have what have we, we touched on so far as far as what's in what could potentially be in biosolid based materials pfos uh psychiatric medications hormones and the last one is fluoroquinolone antibiotics uh, okay, real quick, uh, Nick, Nick asked about, you know, are we sure what the dangers are? Yeah, we're sure what the dangers are. But again, we don't know what's acute and what's chronic yet, right? So um, as far as health effects, reproductive effe uh, health effects, um, decreased fertility, uh, which, by the way, I mean, just looking around at the news, I, I, if, I don't know if you're aware, but fertility is a big issue right now. Uh, it is uh, more people are suffering from suffering from infertility issues uh, even men uh, at a at a greater degree ever before in history men and women are suffering from infertility issues uh high blood pressure um uh developmental effects or delays in children including low birth rate uh, accelerated puberty bone variations behavioral changes increased risk of cancers including prostate kidney and testicular cancers reduced ability of the body's immune system to fight infections including reduced vaccine response interference with the body's natural hormones increased cholesterol levels and, or risk of obesity this is direct from the epa so and, it, and again it's not to say that you're going to experience all those things however there's a degree of probability there that exists and I, again who, what, when, where, and how that ends up occurring, yeah, we don't know, but we do know that according to the body of evidence that we have right now, that all these things are possible uh, in some four degree of fashion. So anyway, that's where we are on that. Uh, one, one more thing is um, Gardner Earth guy asked, um, what is the plant uptake on plastics? Here's the thing is that a plant isn't necessarily just going to take up a plastic, right? But uh, you got to think about all the different things that can occur, uh, can occur in soil, right? So you have microbial mineralization we're applying all kinds of surfactants we're applying all kinds of dispersants um uh, uh stabilizing agents and what can happen is that there can be a degree of solubility that occurs right because a lot of the times what ends up in our in our in our uh, our soils and stuff are going to be you think about it this way right we have low density plastics and we have high density plastics a lot of the things that we're handling especially as LCOs are going to be low density, uh, uh, plastics, right? So you think about bags, uh, uh, containers, those low density plastics, low density, meaning not as hard. Um, it, there is some potential for effects that it can become solubilized to an extent that can make its way into a plant. Again, that could also be through mineralization that occurs in the soil. And then, yeah, it does. And it may not be necessarily the plastic, but it could be a component of the plastic, right? You have isocyanates that are used. Uh, uh, you have, you know, polyvinyl alcohol that's used. You have all these different components that come together. You have uh, fluor fluorinated silanes that are that are used. That's that's <laughs> a, a big one that's used to produce plastic, right? And a fluorinated silane per fluoroalkyl substances. Right. Do you see where I'm going with this? You know, so I got another again, one for you. That's plastic. What's that? Matt. That is plastic that? related. Phthalates. That yes. Phthalates. Yes. Okay. And here is the issue with phthalates. Phthalate, you know, and the moieties that are related to phthalates are known endocrine affecting chemicals specifically phthalates are estrogenic met they're estrogenic so let's have some phthalates that way we can all be girls <laughs> yeah so <laughs> nick it's it's not as easy to say, you know, flat out that oh, we're sure bad things are going to happen. Yeah, we're sure about that. Again, it's the timelines, the degree of severity that we're not we're not sure about. But I mean, yeah, it's it's. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm talking to Garner Earth guy. Uh, yes, in some degree, form, or fashion, it is making its way into plants. Um, driving somewhere for the eclipse on Saturday, depending on the weather report. Any chance that there are spray heads in the path towards Indiana if the weather is that way? By the way, if you are, reach out to Garner Earth guy. He's also in the Discord. And uh, I'm sure there are a shit ton of lawn care guys somewhere in or along the way. It's just who's going to have availability. Uh, the Lake Okeechobee thing, uh, Okeechobee thing with sugar production, it gets the fertilizer wrap, but it's is the Lake Okeechobee issue really the dams? My wager in Reno is dams. I, I'd see, I don't know enough about this. And I'll tell you what, is that you should honestly come on the show and educate us on Lake Okeechobee because 
Uh, the only thing we really know is what's going to be in the news. And we're not actually out there in the real world, you know, that this is what's going on on the ground. So I, uh, I, I recommend you come up, come on the show, Richard. We'll have, we'll have a good time with it. Even if you just want to do it in audio, we can do it that way as well too. Okay. Now, uh, so we're going to wrap that up. We were going to talk about this, right? So Oscar wrote in and he said, Hey Matt, I wanted to get your all's advice on my turf for this upcoming season. I've got St. Augustine in the front, Zorja in the back. I'm located in Texas on the border. I tend not to return clippings on the Augustine because I get hit with gray leaf spot and take a root rot almost yearly. Zorja is looking good going into the season, thinking I'll just ride AMS and urea, maybe some micros to maintain on that. St. Augustine is a turf I struggle with due to my pH and disease pressure for fun. I'm sending in soil tests from last year. Before finding y'all, I was heading into the YouTube lawn care rabbit hole. I was writing the yard mastery program and did a yard mastery soil test, which came back with a pH of 6.8. I decided to send samples into A&M extension for comparison. That test came back with a pH of 8. Big difference. Appreciate any guidance. Really enjoy the show. Okay, so what's again, we were I was talking about this at the start of the show, and now we're, we're going to do a deep dive on this, right? So, uh, again, uh, turf epistemology on... Um, on YouTube, check out Dr. Shaddix. He went into soil dust methodologies, extractants, uh, especially his episode with uh, with Dr. Michael Woods. Very insightful. Can give you a lot of the uh, the deep details there. And I think you can you can join it for like nine bucks a month and get unfettered access to him. So I mean, what a mind to 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 tap into right there. Uh, but what we wanted to do was take a look at it from a a practical applied science standpoint of where we have two soil tests. Uh, one conducted using a traditional acid extractant and then another performed via the ion exchange resin. And then let's see what kind of results we end up getting. Uh, JP, if you don't mind, go ahead and pull up the yard mastery one first. And, um, and then we'll, we'll take a look at this. So just some things that stand out right here. We're, and don't pay attention to what's over on the right where it says low, low, high, 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 low, good, low, 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 low. But We'll look at actual values here, right? So we have a phosphorus value of 0.6, which is, which is low on this. Potassium, which is 12, which is low on this. We have sulfur of 772. We have calcium of 1250. In anybody's soil test, if you come back and you got a 1250 on calcium, you're probably good. And you're like, hey, man, that's good. It's good calcium level. Here we see we're high because the, our, our scaling goes to 314. Sulfur, we're at 772. Anybody pulls a, a, a t soil test and it comes back with 772 in sulfur, you're going to be like, holy shit, that's high. And again, here, according to this scale, that's high too. 7 to 16 is what they recommend. And then if we go down to pH, we see pH is 6.8. And then we'll just make a note <laughs> that P and K are low according to the metrics here. And then uh, iron, zinc, copper, and boron are low according to the metrics here. And we have a pH of 6.8, which would be sufficient. If you got a, a 6.8 pH, everybody's going to be high-fiving, uh, tongue-kissing their, mm -hmm. their partner or wife or husband or whoever, however you do it. I don't give a shit. And, uh, <laughs> and feeling really good about life, right? Um, but then, but then we actually perform a non ion exchange. This is an ion exchange resin test here. So basically what you do is you drop a capsule in there, it's releasing ions and then it's capturing, uh, what, what comes back as, as ions are released into solution. Right. And, uh, in, in theoretically what this is supposed to, to give you is data that is more akin to what the root sees, What it does not take into account is that what the root can actually tap into. One of the beautiful things that we have uh, with with turf grasses in general is something called root exudates. And different species of plants are going to have different degree of exudates, but turf grass in general are going to be pretty strong exudators uh, that allow us to tap into a lot of these things that we otherwise would not have the ability to, to, to tap into. So when we talk about plant availability a lot of that is a bunch of hoorah or nutrients being locked up a lot of that is a <laughs> bunch of hoorah because we have root exudates and that is going to be that symbiotic relationship that occurs between the plant itself and the soil uh and the uh and the and the, uh, the biology of the soil where roots will give up certain amino acids or organic acids like oxalic acid uh, uh citric acid uh malic acid uh, in exchange uh, for uh, 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 nutrients, right? So, you know, it's emitting that through the root system, citric acid, you being an actual organic acid, uh, it can start to solubilize things like like bound up P, you know, P that's, that's bound to calcium. And then uh, it, as it exchanges that, it gets back to phosphorus in return. And, uh, and then the plant can continue on living, even though, you know, you've got a 
quote unquote low test here. All right. So that's why when we do acid extractants, it's to make it uh, uh, more akin to what the plant can actually find versus what the plant actually sees at first glance, right? Okay. Ion exchange resin is what the plant sees at first glance. It's not an actual picture of what's there. Now, we'll take a look at Texas A&M. And if you don't mind, do the 2023 one, JP. Yep, perfect. Uh, this is what is actually there. And what we see is a significant difference. 63 parts per million of phosphorus, 324 parts per million of potassium, and a pH of 8. What it did get right mm. is that we did get sulfur right. We did get sodium to a degree right. We did get manganese to a degree right. However, our iron is off, our zinc is off, our copper is off, and our boron is off. We went to boron, we don't even need to really worry about it anyway. But just to point out the fallacy of the test methodology in general, uh, this is not just significant. This is not just statistically significant. This is foobard, as a matter of fact. <laughs> A, a soil pH test of a 6.8 compared to an 8 is absolutely foobard. That's not a little bit off. That's fucked up. There's no other way to put it. That is fucked up. That's way off. Like, well, that's way off, Matt. Super way S off. I mean, where are you at? Because Chris Boardman? pH, where you at? Yeah, pH is on a logarithmic scale, right? So, uh, what is it? 6.8 versus 8. So we are off 1.2 pH points. And that is like being wrong, you know, 120 times over. <laughs> you know, that's like being wrong. Yeah. That's like being super yeah. wrong. You're not just, you're not a little wrong because you know what, Matt? I can accept a pH difference of 0.1, I can take that. But I get suspicious when a pH test is different by half a point or greater. I wonder what's going on when you have a pH test of a half a point or greater. And, and you know what else is significant about a pH of 8? A pH of 8 means that Serious attention should be paid to reducing calcium and sodium in the soil to make that soil more conducive to healthy plant growth. I mean, the, that's just uh, because at a pH of 6.8, if anybody saw a pH 6.8, you're not wrong because... Uh, you know, 6.8 would be, okay, hang it up. Let's, uh, we don't need Sorry, to do anything. It's party time. Lap. We got a 6.8 yeah. pH. Yeah. <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> yeah. We got a 6.8. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right, and just to just to con continue on here, you know, the difference between a phosphorus level of 0. 0.6 and 63 is significant, right? So we're talking all, we're talking we are off by a factor of 100, right? Our potassium okay. levels we're coming in at 12, and what we're seeing here is a uh, is 324. We're talking about a factor of uh, of 30. That is that is off. Mm -hmm. That is bad. Okay, and that and why that's bad is that if you get look at your soil, your my soil test recommendations, what's going to be recommended a one one one, and it'll it'll recommend a yard mastery one one one, which I, I is going to be the I think it's a triple twelve, and um, I don't have the label in front of me. Let's see, uh, twelve 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 yard mastery. I'm I'm going to look at this label real quick. Okay. Uh, it is, it's, it's got bio night in it. So we got bio solids, which we were just talking oh, about with, uh, uh, with the lovely. PFAS. So we're getting an application of PFAS. We are getting, uh, let me zoom in on this here. Zoom. But hey, man, zoom. at least the, I can't even zoom. At least the, at least the grass won't, won't be depressed and the grass probably won't have children either because you get a free dose of, uh, Psychotropics and birth control. <laughs> oh, 
all free. So I mean. <laughs> we've got we've got a little bit of urea. We have a little bit of ammonium sulfate. We've got and we've got we've got PFAS as our nitrogen sources here, right? So a little bit of urea, a little bit of ammonium sulfate, and uh, and PFAS, <laughs> and then and then we've got ammonium phosphate, and uh, we have uh, is it is it have sulfate of potash and and and, and MOP. potassium chloride and potassium chloride it's a it's a it's I a can't blend. I can't read it real well it is uh it is really um it's, it's blurry. not easy to see. It, it, yeah it's super well, blurry anyway point point bank right so okay um we, we okay here here we go we're at we're at 63 parts per million. We're at 324 parts per million of potassium. We apply a triple 12. How much of that is going to generate a response in turf grass? The answer is 0, 0.0. It's just none. none. And because it's not generating a response in turf grass, what does that mean it's doing? That means it's depositing it just, into the soil. And when it's in the soil, what risks do we face by depositing something the soil already has sufficient levels of? Oh, and how's this one? The plant is not likely to uptake it because the pH is deranged in the first place. That too, which it completely yeah. foobar. Yeah. yeah, so... so we're creating more conditions that we're applying nutrients that we don't need that are contributing to the potential of causing the problems that we have by applying nutrients that our plants don't need. So it's the whole cycle here is fucked. You just no matter how you look at it, from the pH is fucked, from the nutrient recommendations is fucked, from what is actually available in the soil to the turf grass is fucked. It's all fucked. Okay. Now, Let's talk about why. Why is the pH so fucked? All right. And Ray has done a fantastic job of un unpacking the equation here. And, and Ray, why is it that when you package your soil in water to send it to a test <laughs> that we're seeing a pH skew 1.2 logarithmic? It is because when you pack water and soil together, send it in a sealed cup, you are creating the perfect conditions for hydrolysis to occur. And that hydrolysis is also occurring under anaerobic conditions because it's a sealed cup, right? Because this is the same cup that you piss in when they make you take a drug test, all right? It's the same damn cup. But my point is, is that. Here's that cup of soil with water, with the ion exchange resin. You pack it in the box, and it's bumping along in your uh, postman's truck all the way until it gets to this lab, which, by the way, on average, that takes anywhere from three to five days. So that is three to five days for this soil to go through hydrolysis under anaerobic conditions. And so. Here's what happens when you have anaerobic conditions in soil. It's very easy for that soil to become acid when it's exposed to water in the absence of oxygen. Okay? It's very easy. And what makes that condition even more likely, there's a second number that I'm looking at right here, Matt, that is flashing at me sulfur. Because what happens to sulfur. When you have sulfur-rich soils under anaerobic conditions, is that sulfur turns into sulfides? Hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide. I thought, no, Matt. Matt and I were just were just joking. It smells I like prom 2004. The, <laughs> no, I pity the fool that has to open that sample cup. It's good prom. At the my soil lab. Because, Christian Brothers. damn, that's going to smell horrible. I mean, hydrogen sulfide is the smell of sewage. <laughs> it smells nasty. So, but then 
chemically, you have all of these changes that are happening randomly in this, you know, sample because, you know, if I wanted to do an ion exchange type test, Matt, here's how I would do it. I'd send it dry and I'd have them shake that up with water at the lab at the and lab. have it exposed have it exposed to that water for a set determined amount of time. Like, okay, let that say, let that thing sit for an hour and say, when your hour is up, we're going to pull that resin and test it, not have it uh, bumping along in the, you know, United States postal service truck for, for three or four days. Yeah. No. <laughs> and that's just it. There's no control over the time that it makes it back. You know, what if it goes to another city on accident, it gets there and it's been in water mm -hmm. for eight days. Uh, again, mm -hmm. he's, he's at a border town and this has to go to the Pacific Northwest. That shipping lane is not an easy shipping lane. Uh, <laughs> so I could see it taking four or five days to get there. That's a longer period of hydrolysis that gets to occur. Um, and then, and that's why you start getting results skewed like this, right? So what I would expect, if you were just doing a water solubility test on this soil, uh, one, I would, I would expect to see the pH a hell of a lot higher, but, uh, you know, it would be one of those things. Phosphorus would be low, right? Because you have traditionally high, uh, high calcium, Texas soil, right? The, the, any bit of soluble phosphorus is going to immediately bind up to calcium and, or any of the, any of the micronutrients that show up. And, uh, and so what I would expect is that you would see a really low P number. You would be really low in, uh, iron, zinc, manganese, copper. Um, and, and because all that, all that's going to bind up to either calcium or phosphorus and, in order just be inert. I, I, I would expect to see the, the potassium a little higher, to be honest. And, and then, of course, you know, uh, sulfates and, uh, and sodium, for the most part, is, is relatively uh, uh, water-soluble. So I could see high conductivity. I could see being able to measure high sulfur levels, high sodium levels. And so you, you, you can see kind of the, the fallacy of the test, and you, and you can kind of predict what, what you're going to get with it. But the, the level of uh, ambiguity that begins to occur here of, of mystery, I will say, is that what happens under anaerobic uh, hydrolyzing conditions, right? And that's, and that's where we get the wild card on a lot of this that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Then on the flip side of this is that the, re the recommendations that occur, whether you're following MLSN, whether you're following SLAN, whether you're following B BCSR, whether you're following yard mastery recommendations, every single one of them are going to be fucked because the data that you got is not accurate to what is actually contained in the soil. What you're getting a picture of is a very temporary snapshot of what the root sees in just an absolute fucking instant of time and not what the root actually has the ability to utilize right so in terms of what to do about this uh, uh oscar is easy um like i say easy it's not necessarily easy it's going to be a very long-term project <laughs> but you know <laughs> ammonium sulfate uh you, you a, a good a good citric acid uh sulfur program to continue to acidify Flush your it. soil yeah mm -hmm. if, and again if you can if you have access to clean water one of the things i love on the test is that they recommended a 10 to 15 inch clean water flush to reduce conductivity good luck trying to find that in texas you won't i don't i don't think you'll be able to do a clean leach on this to save your life uh it is what it is however uh, again, you know, irrigating that in and through to begin working on pH. I don't think you need to be out there hammering it with, with iron or anything other than um, ammonium sulfate. You know, if you, if you don't, if you don't have access to ammonium sulfate, this is where I was, I had in my head earlier, ammonium nitrate, you can do, you can use <laughs> ammonium nitrate if you can get your hands on that. Not a bad idea. Um, but it, it, that, that you have it, you have a nitrogen only in a, in a, in a pH reduction program and that's it, especially since you're suffering from tar, uh, take all root rot. Right. I mean, that's, it's, Matt, it's a no brainer, right? So acidification, I, even, I even give if you one, one of the top dress with like peat moss, I'm, I'm not going to be against you there either. Yeah. Because the thing about take all is that, you know, who else told me about how 
Tacol is affected by raise, you know, lowering your soil pH. Dan, Dan the lawman. Oh yeah, that's right. Dan the lawman talked about it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. He said that you start driving down the soil pH by appropriate nutrient choices and maybe even some sulfur amendment. Your incidence and severity of Tacol is decreased, and in fact. It can be to the point where it's possible to rehabilitate a lawn that is affected by take all root rot just by getting a handle on your pH. And that's because... that's also a recommendation from Texas A&M. That's a recommendation from University of Georgia. That's a recommendation from Auburn. You'll see it all across the southeast. That is a general recommendation to acidify your soil if you have take all root rot. Mm hmm. So. Uh, there, I think, I think we put the kibosh on this. And if you are considering <laughs> using this test, test methodology, I hope this is one of, it has to be 10 at this point that we've gone over to demonstrate this. Uh, and again, if you're interested in learning the nuance of the different methodologies and extractants that are used, I highly recommend checking out Dr. Shaddix and, uh, Dr. Woods's conversation on it. Uh, that is two of the, of the geekiest guys in turf grass that actually give us highly actionable data. And, uh, and I just, I can't recommend it enough. Again, I, one thing that I will, I will say not to suck them off too aggressively here, but I always said that the day that I didn't learn anything in this industry would be the day that I, I got bored and left it. And, uh, and, and having a YouTube channel like that from, from Dr. Michael Woods and from Dr. Shaddix is that it, it gives me a concise place to go that I can throw it in my headphones and make sure that indeed I do learn something new every day. I have, I have no issues whatsoever about that. And it makes it easy to see the roadmap that no matter how long I study for the years that I'm alive, that there's, there's an endless amount of information to continue to learn and evolve and do as much as we possibly can. Uh, to try to put our best foot forward, right? And I think that's what we're all doing. It's We're not doing this in an, in an effort to shit on my soil. What we are doing is to say that there are better ways out there that are going to give you better metrics to make better decisions while you're out in the field. So you're not creating a situation where when someone presents you with the data, what if you are a lawn care operator and you show your my soil test to your plant board that you get accused of poisoning a waterway and your plant board is showing you a soil test from the Texas A&M Extension Service and you're like, but my soil test says this and they're like, yeah, because it's an iron exchange resin and I'm sorry, yeah, you have been applying phosphorus way in excess of what you needed to. You've been applying potassium way in excess of what you needed to. And that's on you for making that decision because nowhere in our literature are we recommending using or nowhere in our BMPs are we recommending a, an ion exchange resin. You know, you got who dude on something you saw on YouTube. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> who's, who does that fall on? It doesn't fall on your boss. It doesn't fall on the company you work for. That falls on you, whoever holds the license that is out there making the applications. And then in, in the event this ever starts to affect people at the homeowner level, again, you too, you don't want to be stuck holding data that is not applicable to what you're doing in your lawn, right? This is not ag. We're not looking for a snapshot of time where we're at V4 and we're about to go to tassel and we have to make sure that our zinc numbers are exactly right for kernel formation or whatever else, right? This is not ag. This is turf grass. We need a more complete picture to give us a, uh, a, a broader sense of what, of what we can actually achieve with less. Okay. All right. That's our story. We're sticking to it. We're going to dip out of here. We've got some questions already lined up for, um, uh, Next time, it, it, yeah. one, one thing, yeah. One thing I do want to say too. one of the, cri the critiques I've heard is that when a traditional lab receives a soil sample, they dry it and grind it. Do you know why that is done? They dry it and grind it because Again, they are using, they do not want water to influence the results. When they are looking for accurate data, if you're using an extractant, especially an acid as an extractant, if you add, if you take into account the moisture content of the soil, that would dilute the acid, therefore not give you a total picture of what's in it. And if you don't grind it up and mix it, then you're not dealing with a truly homogenized soil. You may be dealing with a pocket of something. So it's imperative. Anybody that works in any sort of material sciences know 
knows, and this is material science 101 that any university will teach is that you dry it and you grind it in order to ensure, ensure true homogenization before you test it. Uh, so I just want to get that out of the way. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to go hang out with our patrons, patreon.com forward slash burn and return. If you're into that kind of thing, I will tell you that it's a community of people that are just genuinely interested, just like we like to get up here and talk about the things that we learn. Uh, it's the same thing. It's a community of people that want to be able to, to learn more, whether, whether that means you want to be a better dad, you want to be a better business owner, you want to be a better, whatever industry you work in, you just, you want to, to, to see, do achieve, conquer more, uh, then I will say that our, our, uh, our Patreon program is for you. Uh, I don't care if you're a fitness nut. I don't care if you're a lawyer. I don't, I don't care what you do. If you're a, a fucking automations programmer, there's, there are people in there for you. It's, it's a community. It's a community for you. Uh, check it out. Patreon.com forward slash burn return. Now we're going to go watch videos of other people that are making absolute fucking fools of themselves and try and critique it in the most scientific way we can while keeping our shit together so it doesn't run out of our ear, ear holes as it melts our brain. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, so Maybe. I'm going to go lick a window, and uh, we'll see y'all on the flip side. Blech. Blech. <laughs> a window licker mad over here after watching these videos. Oh, dear. Oh, <laughs> dear.